I'm Sarah Tilly from Curious Maths. I'm a primary maths consultant based in London and I've been in education for over 20 years. I'm an absolutely massive fan of teaching math through story and this video is a follow-up to the video I did a couple of weeks ago um, which was the maths books on my shelf, the story books, the picture books that I've got relating to maths that are suitable for three to seven year olds and so I'm following it up now with this video which are the other books on my math shelf which are suitable for children between the ages of seven and eleven. And of course, there's obviously a bit of flexibility. So I've got 10 fantastic books to show you that I think are fantastic for the classroom for children between seven and 11 years or great at home to share with your child. I hope you find it useful. So before I show you 10 of the books from my bookshelf, I just want to draw your attention to two amazing books that I've already talked about before. So this stunning book is called How Big is a Million? And on my YouTube channel, I have got a playlist called I Love Maths Through Story. And I have got a video all about this book and I've matched it to the English Maths National Curriculum. So I've matched it to year five and there's loads of games and ideas and activities that you could use either at home or in school around this book. So do check that one out. And the other one is Circumference and All the King's Tens. And again, it's an absolutely fantastic book. I've matched this to year four, uh, the year four maths curriculum. I think it works really well. It's all about place value. But I've done a video all about this on my playlist. So do check it out. Loads of ideas for you to do at home or at school. Right, let me show you the ones I've got for today. So this is book one, How Many Legs by Kez Gray and Jim Field. And it's a lovely book. It's beautifully illustrated and it's got opportunities for mental calculation. You could obviously turn it into written calculation too. It's however you'd like to do it. And I used this book very recently with some year fours and we did, um, we did it as mental calculation, but they were allowed to write some jottings. So this is a story about how many legs. And so this little lad here is wondering how many legs would there be if in this room there was only me? So, And then slowly but surely different animals start coming in and that adds to the mental calculation. So how many bears, how many legs would there be if a polar bear came to tea? So of course we've got then got six legs and so forth. And a duck comes along and a hippo. And all this time the children are calculating how many legs are on that animal and how many they need to add to their ongoing count. And I wandered around the room and I showed them the pictures and those children that weren't sure how many legs something might have, they needed to have a, a little look. But how many legs would you see if a dog walked in with a ch chimpanzee? So lots to talk about. Um, estimating, perhaps. So when I did this, first of all, with children, um, they wanted another go. So they wrote their, uh, their answers down. And then they really wanted me to read the story again so they could check it. So at that point, we just shared a few answers. And we started to think about how similar or different they were. And for some children, they realised at that point that they were really far off the actual answer. And that, that was quite useful. So beautiful illustrations. We haven't got any numerals on the page. We haven't got any numbers on the page because this is all about children calculating. But there are countable things. So children could point to the legs and count them go right through a centipede and that's a good opportunity to talk about the word scent being linked to 100 and finally joined by a dinosaur and at the end of the book you've got this really nice blackboard image where it actually has little pictures and actually annotates the number of legs that are on each animal and that's really quite helpful as a teacher when the children say what came after the octopus uh, and you can actually pick it out from there so it finishes with the idea of lots being the answer, which of course the children are not satisfied by. And then at the end, we have the correct answer. So this is how many legs. Great for mental calculation. Book number two is Bean 13. And this is a lovely book to do if you're doing any work around division um, or odd numbers or even prime numbers actually. Um, but this book really helps to the children to think about grouping or sharing and actually having one left over. So if you're about to explore remainders, this is a great book to look at. So it's a, it's a lovely story, beautifully illustrated, about two ants who are collecting beans, Ralph and Flora. And Ralph is particularly concerned because they have 12 beans and Flora wants to pick another one, which makes 13 beans. And he thinks that's an unlucky number. So 
she says he's being silly and they take the beans home and they put, make them into piles, they share them equally and you can see there is one left over. So what a great opportunity to interject before here and ask children how many they'll have left, etc. So Ralph's not happy about it, um, so he wants to invite people round, or Flora has the idea of inviting people round to maybe solve the one leftover problem. And that's where it becomes interesting, because no matter how many guests arrive, they are not able to share them equally without having a remainder. And they go right up to five piles. So there's loads of opportunities for children to predict um, to have counters on their table or stones or whatever it is, and actually, or beans might be an even better idea, um, to actually make the arrays, because that's what we've got examples of, and see that one left over. You could challenge them to think, can they find a number that they wouldn't have one left over? And the story goes on. So Ralph, um, still not very happy, can't stand it, he's really upset about being 13. And then actually all the guests arrive, everybody has a great time. And there's nothing really to worry about because people just help themselves to the beans and it doesn't really matter that somebody's got three and somebody's got one and somebody's got two because that is just perfect for them. So there it goes. The story finishes with there not being a problem with being 13 until Ralph thinks maybe he ate it. So it's a lovely story to do if you're doing anything around odd numbers or division or prime numbers. Book number three is One of a Kind by Neil Packer. And this is a fabulous book all about sorting and classifying. It's actually quite a big book as well. It's quite sturdy. And this is an absolutely stunning book to show examples of the way information can be sorted and classified. So we're thinking about statistics here and how we represent um, ideas in, in mathematics and in science and in things like that. Um, I think this is the kind of book children get lost in. So I've put this book down before or given this book to a pair of children and they spend ages just looking at the, the, all the information. Absolutely fabulous. So I'm going to show you a few pages to give you a bit of a feel. So this is Arvo and this is Arvo's family. And straight away, we have got a fantastic example of classifying information. This is Arvo's cat, Malcolm, and this is Malcolm's family. And actually, even on the two pages, slightly different representations and an opportunity to talk about why that might be the case and why, why that one might be in two halves, whereas this one seems to be all linked. Arvo and his cat belong to an even bigger kingdom, the animal kingdom. It's an absolutely stunning way of organising with information all the different groups and species and genus and families and orders and class etc within the kingdom. Musical instruments and vehicles and the book carries on like this but it's just pages after pages of data organised in different ways. So children could be writing uh, questions for each other, they could be representing this data in, in another way, perhaps in a graph or something like that. It could be linked to maybe some of their topics, but absolutely stunning. And it, it does go on, there is a lot of information. <laughs> so the library, are those cheese board, it's the sort of book that children will just sit down and look at. And it's just lovely to look at how varied it is. And at the back, there's a little bit of information about sorting into things into groups and talking about how that's why we make sense of the world. A little bit of additional information. So an absolutely stunning book all about sorting and classifying. Book number four is The Lion's Share, and this is written by the same gentleman who wrote Bean 13, so we've got an ant featuring again. And this is quite different to the book I just showed you on sorting and classifying, because this really is a story book. It's got a story in it that you can latch onto. So every year, the lion has a party, and the ant hadn't been invited before and was delighted to receive her invitation, along with lots of other animals. But when she arrived, she was absolutely horrified to see that the other animals had most, the most atrocious manners and she really wanted to impress the lion. Anyway, the lion gave out the cake and passed it on 
to the animals to take some. And this is where the fraction part really starts to become interesting. So the elephant looked at the cake. I could eat this in one bite, he thought, but that might seem greedy. With a grand gesture, he cut the cake in half and passed the rest onto the hippo. What a pig, thought the hippo. But if he's taking half, I'm taking half of what's left. She made a slice down the middle and handed the remaining one quarter of the cake to the gorilla. So you can see already, predicting how much is the next animal going to get? What do you think the next animal is going to do? What's a half of a quarter? How do you know? Can you draw it? There's so much. And that carries on. That idea carries on and it gets passed on and passed on. And you can continue to talk about the conversation. And proportionately, the pictures match, which is very important until it finally reached the ant and the ant basically had a tiny, tiny weeny sliver and she couldn't cut it into because it just crumbled. And all the other animals were like, oh, typical ant, greedy. We all shared, she didn't. And the ant was really upset about that. So she went to the lion and said, please forgive me, let me make you a cake. And she offers to bring her special strawberry sponge cake to the lion. And the king is, is very grateful for that and says the ant is very generous, but the other animals aren't having any of it. And this is where the multiplication can start to come in because everybody wants to better each other. So the beetle thought, my king, to show my thanks, I would like to bake you two cakes tomorrow, double chocolate fudge cake. And then the frog says, I'm going to bake, bake you four and so forth. And you can see by the images and you can probably work out what is happening next. So lot, again, lots of predictions, lots of use of arrays. Children can use counters and pegs to uh, represent. And actually, quite excitingly, the number get, numbers get reasonably big. And that's why I think it's more suitable for children over seven um, for them to actually realise the maths that's happening. So there's all these great big grand gestures. Goes right up to 256. Um, but the ant decides that she's not going to worry about it. And she just takes extra, extra special care about the one cake she's got to make. And a really good opportunity to talk to children about actually one quality cake is probably better than 256 rubbish cakes if they weren't able to be cooked properly and managed properly etc and the story ends very nicely where the ant takes her cake to the king and the king says it's delicious and wants to share it with her so lions share a tale of halving cake and eating it too Book number five is 100 Hungry Ants, another ant-themed maths book. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, beautifully illustrated, really fantastic if you're teaching something around factors or times tables or division. It, it works really nicely. And what's great about it is there's a really strong story. So if you're a class teacher, you can plan the story over a couple of days, um, weaving the math through it, getting children to stop and predict and do some math as you go along. Same if you're a parent, or you can simply just share the book and ask questions as you go along. That's the beauty of Math Through Story. So this story is all about 100 hungry ants and they get a waft through the breeze um, of some food. So they know that there's a picnic going on. So they charge to go and get the food. And they're very happy, positive ants charging towards the picnic. Um, but suddenly they start to realise that if they stay in a long row of 100, then it's going to take them quite a long time for all of the ants to get there. And so somebody comes up with, the littlest ant comes up with an idea. We're moving way too slow. Some of the food will be long gone. What about two lines of 50? We will get there soon, I know. It's all rhyming as well. So... They organised themselves and rushed off in their two rows to the picnic. And the same thing happens. Some of the um, littlest ants at the back, they say, we're not going to get there, we're moving too slow again. And that's how the story continues, thinking of different ways to get to the picnic instead of one long line of 100. So you've got your factors, you've got your division, you could even look at it as a multiplication. So they, get, they then decide to do four lines of 25, five lines of 20. And there's great visuals here that children can see. And you, can, you know, obviously they can have counters and cubes and, and, and or draw pictures to mimic what's going on. Get them to predict, you know, some of the children before you read the book, some of the children might have a really good idea of a good way of doing it before you even get to this page. And finally, 10 lines of 10. 
and they've arrived there they've taken so long with their rows reorganizing themselves they rushed around and there was no food left and they all started chasing the one little ant away so that's 100 hungry ants Book number six is an absolutely stunning book about Ada Lovelace, the world's first computer programmer. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of books you can get out there if you want to explore Ada's life. But I've decided to show you this one um, because it's just so beautiful. I'm not going to read through the story of Ada Le Lovelace. Um, I'm just going to show you the pictures so you get a feel of, a feel of the book. Um, but absolutely gorgeous. Actually, Ada dreamed of making a steam-powered flying horse, and her mum did despair. She wanted her to be sensible and marry and have children, but she wanted to be more than that. And it tells the story of her life with stunning illustrations about her. Ada's mother was a mathematician, and she had a joy for maths, and actually Ada was encouraged very heavily to be involved in mathematics. talks about the Industrial Revolution, factories, the machines, and how Ada was fascinated by them. Still thinking about her mechanical horse. <laughs> and actually Ada was ill for quite a lot of her childhood and um, she had measles and for three years, she couldn't really walk or do anything. And she had to kind of give up on her ideas of flight and focus on her studies, but actually, obviously, that had quite a big impact on everything that she was going to achieve in the future. And it talks about um, her meeting up with Mr. Babbage and looking at his latest invention, and then them working together to produce a machine, which Ada did the coding for. So as you can see, absolutely stunning, celebratory, you're doing one women in history project a really great edition as i said there's lots of other books out there that look at ada Lovelace's life it's just that i happen to really like this one book number seven is fractions in disguise it's quite an entertaining book it's got a very strong story written um all the way through it weaved through it so you really get hooked on the actual um, plot and things like that and it's really mostly about equivalent fractions so if you're going to do any work exploring equivalent fractions this would be a great book to explore with the class there's quite a lot in it so i wouldn't necessarily read it all in one go um, for example there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't notice first time when you read it and the names of the characters are really interesting and there's lots of questions within it so this is all about a little lad, the main character, who um, doesn't collect baseball cards and things like that. He actually collects fractions. Um, and there's loads of references you can see even on the first page. And But for me, it all adds up. You know, there's lots of little comical lines cleverly written. And there's this great idea about new fractions being invented and then going up for auction and everybody was always wanting to buy them and going along. And of course, the main character was very keen. Um, but it doesn't go to plan because there is some foul play and somebody steals the fraction, their brand new fraction that they were all wanting to buy. And the story continues in this way about how this character is going to hide the fraction and how everyone else is going to find the fraction. And this main character creates a reducer which is half ray gun and half calculator made from a whole load of paper clips, a whisk and some discarded computer parts. And what it does is it removes the disguise from the fraction and reduces it to its lowest terms so it, the fraction can be found. How clever is that? And on it goes. So zapping different fractions, reducing them to the lowest term to try and find the fraction that has been stolen. And as you can see, you know, I'm on page 17, it is quite a long book with a lot of information. So this really could go on for quite a few days. Um, and there's, there's him trying to prove to the baddie that he has worked out what he has done. 
So absolutely fun book, really entertaining. Um, children have always really enjoyed this book when I've shared it and a really good opportunity to explore maths and equivalent fractions and simplifying. Um, fantastic. And a little bit of text at the end. And this book is part of the Equal Schmequel, which I showed in the last video that I did. Um, I'm going to show Place for Zero, and I've also shown one of the circumference ones at the beginning. So this is a really nice little series of books. Fractions in Disguise. Book number nine is Maths Curse. Again, beautifully illustrated. So many opportunities for maths. So it's a story about a character whose teacher is called Mrs. Fibonacci and talks about maths being everywhere. Basically, you know, you can think of almost everything as a maths problem. And then there's this idea of this character going through the days of the week, having more and more problems, um, but realizing they're maths problems. So we've got the first sort of page talking about time and how long it takes to get ready and to get dressed, etc. Um, and so every page that you go on, you can stop and talk about the maths. And you could actually lift some of these ideas. So we've got some work on time. We've got some work on measure. Now this is an American book, so it's not the same standard measures that we use, but definitely a conversation. We've got some graph work, some chart work that they have to re work out when it gets on the best. About the number of children in the class, just gorgeous. So there are 24 kids in my class. I just know someone is going to bring the cupcakes to share. We sit in four rows with six desks in each row. What if Mrs Fibonacci arranges the desk to make six rows, eight rows, three rows, two rows? There we are. There's your maths activity if you're teaching it in class straight away. So lots to look at, lots to explore, lots of relatable information, real life links. Now, this is all about a week or a day in a child's life. And all of these things are maths decisions that children experience every day. So I really like it. So lots and lots and lots to do. Lots of exploring. Talks about some more, you know, actually some more complex ideas like binary. I am now a raving math lunatic. What if this keeps up for the whole maths year? And even that's a maths problem. <laughs> so very humorous, lots of fun. And an absolutely gorgeous book. And I love the bit at the end that this character goes into the maths, into their, they think they've broken the curse, not everything's going to be a problem anymore. And um, actually then goes into science and Mrs. Mr. Newton says, you know, you can think of almost anything as a science experiment and the whole process you can imagine would start again but for science. So that is Maths Curse. Book number 10 is 365 Penguins. And you may have heard of this one. This is quite a popular one, um, but really great, great opportunity great to do with children. They absolutely love it. So it's a story about uh, parcel that arrives on New Year's Day and inside that parcel is a penguin and they couldn't find the sender's name, couldn't send the penguin back. There was a note to say I'm number one, feed me when I'm hungry. But actually on day number two, if that wasn't strange enough, on day number two exactly the same thing happens. Day number three exactly the same. It carries on like that until the end of the week. And even at that point, you can imagine, how, you know, the opportunity for maths questions. How many penguins have arrived after one week? How many after two weeks? How many after three weeks? You know, there's loads you can do with it. Now, they've decided they're going to keep the penguins. But by the end of January, there were 31. So there are 31 days in January. Obviously, a great opportunity to do some calendar work and some calculating, thinking ahead, how many penguins in January and February all together. And then they started to realize that storing the penguins is gonna be a bit of a problem. And then we move into groups. So we've got opportunities to do division, arrays, things like that, multiplication. Groups of 15, four of them making 60. How else could we organize the penguins? It's just endless. It just carries on some relation to money, which you could translate into, if you teach in England or Britain, you could translate into pounds, no problem. And mass, how heavy something is. Calendar work, predicting. There, it's just endless. So I'll just show you 
the last couple of pages really beautifully illustrated children really like it i often get a lot of children who try to count the penguins even if it says how many there are so even some opportunities to do some cubed number work and the story continues until there are actually 365 penguins hence the name of the book in the house and it's at that point actually they find out that um, there's nothing untoward going on here. Uncle Victor has been sending them the, the penguins because he wants to introduce them to the North Pole. So off they go to be introduced to the North Pole, except for one, and they think everything's gonna go back to normal and then the doorbell rings and a polar bear arrives and children absolutely love that ending. So, so many maths opportunities with this fantastic book, 365 Penguins. And finally, to finish off, I just want to remind you of these fantastic books, which are really suitable for children between seven and 11 years. We've got Actual Size, Steve Jenkins. We've got the uh, Maths Quest series, actually, and this is the Museum of Mysteries example. And I've also got a stunning book called Infinity and Me. And if you have a look at my Maths Week England, um, live stream on I Love Math Stories, you will find I look at these books in a bit more detail there. So those are 10 of my recommendations for some maths in story for children aged between 7 and 11 years. I hope you found it useful. Please like and subscribe to my channel and head over to my Curious Maths Facebook page for more fun ideas. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.